Yeah, so I wanted to start off by saying that the student protests uh, and encampments have been incredibly impressive. Uh, it's been a huge show of solidarity uh, with the struggle of Palestinians against occupation and genocide. Um, <coughs> feels like these the huge protests have kind of shaken up the Netherlands a little bit. For example, finally, uh, we see the FNV, the biggest labor union of the Netherlands, also speak out against uh, or in, in favor of a, a ceasefire. Too late and too little, I would say, but uh, it's something. Um, uh, when it started in Amsterdam, to me, it really felt like, oh, finally, you know, something is happening. Let's see how far we can go. Um, so for my little introduction here on the panel, I just wanted to um, take a bit of a step backwards and put student protests in perspective. Um, what's their place in the, in the larger uh, movement for a democratic and socialist world? Um, and of course, when, whenever you want to talk about student protests, the, the, the most natural uh, point of reference is the protests of uh, 1968, uh, where we saw a huge student protests um, with uh, also in the Netherlands uh, with occupations of the Maaghehuis, the kind of like center of um, governance for the uh, University of Amsterdam, um, where students uh, demanded uh, more democracy at their uh, universities and yeah, more of a say for students in how their education w was being organized and how the institution was organized. Um, the question of why do did the, the protests erupt among students and not amongst, for example, uh, workers at that time and now, I think part of the explanation is that students have a very uh, particular place in society. Um, they uh, related to this, this position, they can have a kind of um, <coughs> a level of, of energy and a level of um, radicalism, um, which also has to do with the fact that perhaps, you know, they, they haven't started families yet, or they, uh, they uh, don't have uh, the financial concerns that others may have. Well, that might have been the case in 68. I think nowadays we see things a little bit differently. Uh, the uh, work pressure for students has, has risen a lot. Um, and universities have also bureaucratized a lot more and, and uh, kind of corporatized. Um, now we see even less democracy at universities. I think one very telling example is that in the 90s in the Netherlands, the board of the university, I think, um, in general, they were elected. They were an elected organ, um, whereas now the board is appointed. And the council, which is elected, only can only give advice to the board, but the board really has, has all power to do pretty much whatever they want, which you know, the board of my university loves to demonstrate. Um, so, um, right. So I think one thing that kind of remains the same between 68 and, and now is that, that students um, get, you know, they, 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 they have time to spend reading theory, and they are able to, en to engage in context of, of, of discussion and, and critical discussion about uh, the world as a, and what's going on. Um, but I think that in this uh, radicalism that can come from, these, um, from, from this position in society, um, it can also happen sometimes that students run too fast and too far for uh, the rest of society. Um, and I think that's where I want to talk a little bit about some strategic thoughts uh, with regards to uh, student protests. Because this, this running fast and far, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It can be really good to take large steps when the, when the time is right. Um, but I think the only way that that can work is if the students in the movement realize that they cannot do it by themselves. That real large scale change um, is going to have to happen with large parts of uh, society. Um, part of this is because students themselves don't yet have a large kind of economic power in themselves. They aren't yet workers in a workplace. Um, I think one thing, the good thing about is like um, not paying tuition, that's the kind of economic power you can have over a university, but it's not the same as um, being in a workplace where if you stop working, then uh, the production kind of stops. Um, 
So what is needed to for large scale change is a large part of the society to stand behind you. And of course, what is the large group in society? The working class. Um, so crucially, also not to have students burn out. Uh, I think one of the main priorities right now will be uh, broadening uh, the movement. Um, broadening the movement and organizing uh, the people who come into the movement. The new people who are one in uh, the protests and the actions, they need to be able to find structures in which they can participate in the democratic decision-making processes in the movement. Um, they need to discuss together and decide about what is the way forward. That's how you get people who um, learn what is self-governance and what uh, is people's power. Um, and I think for these reasons, uh, having revolutionary organizations in these movements is of crucial importance if the end goal of this would be to actually bring down um, the capitalist system, which uh, that's, the, that's the scale of things we're, we're talking about when we're talking about freeing Palestine. Um, revolutionary organizations can, um, can bring us these, these uh, essential structures and strategic coordination between large groups of people, which also allows for the important lessons that were learned from earlier struggles to be brought over to new generations of activists. Um, because also when this wave of protest ends, um, what we're going to want is to bring all the things we've learned to the next time that people take to the streets. Um, the good thing about, uh, two minutes, yeah. So um, why am I talking about the working class? Well, the good thing about the working class as a class is that it has a huge uh, social and cultural diversity, uh, which brings um, many lessons itself. Uh, they are also positioned in the right spot in society to be able to pressure those who are in, in power and those who do have the vested interest in keeping Palestine occupied and who also uh, need to be defeated. Um, and when the working class is organized in a party, uh, she will be able to coordinate uh, herself, itself, um, to efficiently mobilize um, and to spread the tactics and strategies that uh, proved to work uh, to other areas of the struggle. Um, so in a way, what a revolutionary organization can also do is kind of function as the memory of uh, the working class and of, uh, of the students too, where lessons and knowledge uh, can be preserved. Um, and I think also crucially in, in these moments, they can form a platform for where these discussions can be held, uh, where, which allow us to actually learn those lessons, to make decisions, see if they work. If not, return to each other and say, okay, that worked or it didn't, uh, and how are we gonna proceed based on, on, on that knowledge? Um, yeah, I wanted to leave it at that for now, Thanks, and I uh, look forward to all your discussions too. All right, uh, uh, firstly, thank you for inviting me. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've been uh, organizing in, uh, in both Amsterdam and uh, Rabaut, um, where I work, and um, on a kind of national level through, through Dutch scholars of Palestine. Um, and I just, um, yeah, I want to start off by saying I think we should really kind of um, be very uh, impressed by what we've managed to achieve in the last uh, six weeks. I can't believe it's only been six weeks, um, I think that we really have changed the kind of uh, political landscape definitely within the universities. Um, and I think it's it's something we just really need to build on. Um, and I think it's also been such an intense time for all of us um, because of the, the kind of intensity of the actual organizing, but also the kind of violence that we've all, uh, we've all faced. Um, and I think I'm going to kind of speak a little bit about um, some of the tensions that we've been kind of experiencing, both um, especially kind of thinking about the kind of staff involvement in the student protests, 
um, and also kind of reflecting a bit more broadly on, on the university um, as, a, as a space. Um, and I think one thing is, again, like I think the staff involvement in general has been pretty incredible every, every, ever since the, the first day in Amsterdam. Um, there was uh, a massive staff presence, um, many staying right until the end, right, right until the kind of brutal intervention by the riot police um, on the students. So I think there has been kind of some, quite some solidarity with, within the staff. And I think that, again, um, has been really hard work and um, also kind of not necessarily, uh, not necessarily something that many people were kind of ready for. Um, or, or kind of saw their role as staff, and I think that's a big challenge that we have. Um, how does staff kind of like get involved in, in some of the, the kind of more um, radical kind of organizing within the campus? And I think um, I'll speak about that a little bit. Um, so I think the first thing, the first kind of tension I wanted to talk about is um, so um, this kind of binary that has been created between kind of violent. Um, protest and violent action of the of, of students and kind of peaceful um, as Radboud was called at some points festival vibe uh, vibe kind of uh, encampment um, and that those narratives of course just come from the powerful they come from the say they base they come from the media they come from the politicians um, I remember in our first uh, one of our first meetings with the say they and Radboud they expressed kind of almost pride that we had uh, that Radboud was kind of so peaceful compared to what Amsterdam had done um, and that is something that we've had to really kind of fight against. And I think um, it's also a fight that we've had to have among ourselves as well, um, especially uh, among staff who um, can kind of make uh, interventions on particular actions and kind of decide that this isn't kind of good for the movement. Um, and there's a lot of kind of internal debating, right? Like, which I think is, is okay. But basically, there's also a kind of seeping out of that internal debating into the kind of external um, landscape. And that has, I think, been really, really harmful. Um, and I think the students did a really great job, to be honest, like in terms of kind of um, consolidating and kind of producing a, a national letter that actually kind of defended Amsterdam and recognized what space Amsterdam and the encampment in Amsterdam had given all of us in the rest of the country to actually kind of take a more kind of um, actually kind of claim space within our own campuses and Amsterdam went through such brutal violence of course in order to kind of sacrifice that um, and I think the kind of recognition of that among students has been really good in general um, and I think it's been less good among staff and I think we've been really trying to kind of um, defend that among staff and kind of like get staff to kind of understand that this is about kind of diversity of tactics and also it really that first violence came from the police and I think challenging the kind of media narratives around it who actually kind of commits the violence is so, so important. And I think we can do a lot more to be very defensive actually about kind of what kinds of tactics we're using because actually Radboud, you know, they got kind of, um, we had a camp up for like three weeks and kind of slowly were kind of escalating, doing kind of um, mini occupations or roadblocks or kind of walking through buildings. And, you know, we were kind of like, the we were always kind of testing the line. The students were always kind of testing the line and they were kind of like, and then as, as and then kind of, um, it did give us some more space to kind of be at the table with the, with the Sele Bay or, or the people in power. But basically, is the line gets crossed so easily. They just suddenly decided this week that there was kind of um, a building occupied in Radboud and um, very well painted, in my opinion. It was um, lots of um, beautiful graffiti in the building. Um, and that was the line, right? Then we suddenly were the villains. We were kind of cast out, basically, like Amsterdam was cast out within a day or two. Um, and then we were kind of no longer the people to speak to. Um, and basically they, they then kind of decided that now is the time to kind of brutally um, crack down. And it's no coincidence, of course, that the letter has come out um, on Friday um, when the kind of the, the narrative, the landscape is set where they can continually just brutally crack down on the protest now. And that is going to keep on happening and, 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 and it's only going to get worse, I think. Um, and I think the other thing is that this is completely, of course, very racialized. And um, it's people of color, it's Palestinians that obviously face the biggest um, dangers around kind of the violence that is, is created and, and kind of exercised on the students. And I think, again, that's why it's much, much more important for staff, especially staff, to actually defend very publicly, defend the, the tactics that, that are being used. 
Um, and then the other kind of aspect, two minutes, okay. The other aspect is the kind of incorporation of the, of the movement into kind of institutional logics that kind of basically kind of dissipate the energies. Like, um, and the, obviously the main big example of this is the fucking ethical committees, excuse my language, but like they, um, they kind of came up with this idea of the ethical committees really early on, right? And like, um, I remember big battles around kind of like within the staff, but also within the students a little bit, like, you know, do we engage with this or not? And the thing is that this wasn't anything new, of course, like these were committees that already existed. As you said, the survey base had all the power to kind of reject what these committees say. And so many of us were like, we cannot engage in this. And again, the students were completely united in that. And this is also where the staff kind of also kind of struggled to kind of stay united, I would say, because some were kind of like, no, 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 we can't engage with this, but then some were kind of like, no, no, our job as staff is to kind of engage more in an institutional way, in a different way. And I think that was the kind of big danger in terms of dividing the movement as well, because it basically put this division between the staff and the students where the, say, the base could then say, no, no, we'll just engage with these more, um, these more kind of peaceful people, these people who are kind of more common sense, and then we can ignore the students who keep on kind of doing kind of illegitimate actions. And I think that kind of did create a, a kind of division there. Um, and then that kind of leads on to the final point about kind of how change happens in the universities. And I think we've done a really cool job in the universities uh, around kind of like, actually they are completely apolitical spaces and they have been apolitical spaces for, for a few years or they've been attempted to kind of position themselves as apolitical spaces or, um, and I think, um, we have changed a little bit about, okay, how does change happen? And that, we have proved that activism does work. There is some, that, that there is some room for kind of disruptive actions that actually then get people a kind of seat at the table. And of course it's been kind of dissipated, round up, I will. Um, and then, and then there's, there's two aspects to that. There's one about kind of the tactics that we use, and then there's the other, other aspect of, of the kind of content, right? Like universities right now, and this is only gonna get worse with the, with the right wing government, um, it is that basically anti-colonial ideas are, you know, they have this vibe, they have, they have this idea that we need to listen to all perspectives and then kind of come, kind of come into a kind of middle situation and then basically do nothing, right? But actually it's worse than that because anti-colonial ideas are not, are kind of seen as biased and kind of coming from a too emotional place. Um, often, of course, again, it's so racialized so people of color get kind of, um, accused of being kind of too personally involved in, in making the kind of arguments that need to be made. And again, that's something that we really need to challenge going forward um, to kind of like really challenge this idea of neutrality and kind of um, a political kind of university spaces going forward. Um, so I will end there. Yeah, first, thank you for the organizers for an invitation. And yeah, my name is Ghali, I'm part of Students for Palestine. We're mostly active in Leiden University and around The Hague. And yeah, so I think I just want to go back to the first day of the Amsterdam occupation, because I really remember that day, like, really fondly. So I got into a friend's car at around, like, 9 p.m., and we were already filled by this weird feeling of excitement, and at the same time, apprehension. Are, they, are we going to come in time? Are they going to be able to hold? Are the police going to charge? How can we actually help them? And so we were already like deeply feeling that it was a different moment, it wasn't like usual. And then when we actually got there, I went to join some other comrades facing the encampments from the other side the, of the canal. And then suddenly we see a bunch of lights coming towards us and we're thinking, okay, it's the police, it's the police, something is gonna happen. And then actually when we realize it's actually a crowd like that we've never seen before at the, at the university actually in a really long time, that's the moment where everything changed. Everyone starts chanting, everyone starts going off, and you realize that this is not just a normal action, but we're in the beginning of a, of a new social movement. And I think now that's going down a bit, that's losing momentum, I think it's good to go back on it, to actually analyze it, to actually criticize it, so we can learn from it and we can go forward. I think first thing first, I want to point uh, to a poll that has been recently made, which demonstrate that 50% of the Dutch population is in favor of ending the arms trade with Israel. And so despite years of virulent propaganda, we have managed to change the tide. These last weeks, I've seen friends and people around campus that have never been really interested in what's happening in Palestine or don't want to really be involved in politics in general, but suddenly we're coming to the protests, we're coming to the marches, we're there to chant, we're there to be involved. And I think that's the major thing. We have changed the situation. We have won the culture battle. Most people in this country, most people that are not completely lost, 
are on our side and are ready to get mobilized if we provide the, the, the context and the means for it. And so, as people that decided to spend their, I don't know, their Sunday at the Marxism Festival, like we're pretty much organizers, whether you're really involved or not. So I think it's our role to actually figure out how to translate this cultural, vict this cultural victory into political power, into political power, so that we can force our universities, our institutions in general, to impose to them our demands, even if they don't want to listen, even if they don't want to do anything about it. And for that, again, we need to be able to criticize what we have been doing until now and find the ways to improve it. And I think one of the main criticisms that came to mind when I was looking at what's been happening is that we kind of fell into like a fetishism and lack of self-reflection on our modes of actions. And I want to take a really like, an example, which is the, the, the encampment itself. So like two days ago, I think I was listening to a speech given by an organizer in Columbia University. And she was explaining why they chose that mode of action, why did they do their encampment in that specific loan. And why was that? It was because that was a loan that the university needed for the commencement in the like, uh, events that they have at the end of their US universities. So what that means is that in that case, the mode of action came because there was a target for it. We're doing this because there is a purpose for it, because there is a larger role that, leads us to, that creates a power struggle between us and the ones we are opposing. I think the same was, the same was the case with Amsterdam on the first day. The encampment was not effective because it was an encampment, but because of the mediatic impact it had. Everyone was like in the apprehension of, oh, is it going to come to the new, the, from the US or the Netherlands or not? Everyone was stressed on both sides of the divide. And so it had that mediatic impact. And on top of it, the location was very good because it was basically in the middle of the campus and it was blocking the way with the bridge that was there. I don't know who knows the campus well here. I mean, I think there's a lot of Amsterdam people here, but either way. If you can visualize it, basically it's a really strategic point. And then the encampment format was working really well there because it suited the goal and the direction that it was going for. But at the same time, I think we've seen in a lot of universities what happened. And here, I mean, no shade for the comrades. I think we're all learning from it and we're all improving. I think what we really saw is that the encampment format didn't manage to create those, that kind of power struggle. So the university just did not care, let it happen. And then basically it became against the will of the organizers like camping on campus. It didn't really manage to create the power struggle. And why? Because the mode of action that they chose, or that we chose, uh, came first. Before building a purpose to legitimize its existence. We weren't thinking, what are we doing with this? We were just doing it because we're in solidarity with other encampments or because, oh, we think it's a cool idea to do something like that. And as action is going to start again next semester on campuses, it's going to be really, really important to restart from the beginning. So what's the purpose of an action? Are we putting tents just to put tents? Are we getting arrested just to get arrested? Are we throwing paint just to throw paint? Or is there an objective that we're trying to achieve? Something that leads to a more generalized success. And yeah, I think the second point, I had something else in mind when I was writing this, but I want to come back actually on the staff question, because I think that has been another issue, is that individually, for example, in Leiden, we had a lot of amazing staff members that were really there to support us, to advise us. But when the time came for action, well, there wasn't a structure for the staff members to actually be involved. Because individually, again, their salaries, they have like they're paid by the university, they have their job position, which is at risk. So if there isn't organization, they cannot be able to take decisions. So what would happen is we're getting closer to the action. Obviously, everyone is feeling the stress of it. And because there is no structure, because there is no staff, actual concrete staff organizing beyond the national level, then we lose this immense strength that the, the staff members could bring. Because in the case of the students, why are we able to take these risks? Why are we able to take, make these actions? It's because there's been years of organizing, of structuring. So there's a discipline among the, among the students that are active. There's a trust within each other. We know that even if we have very heavy disagreements, when the moment of action comes, then we're just gonna like, find the consensus that works and we're gonna keep going with it. And I think that's gonna be a priority for the coming months. The staff members need to figure out how they're gonna organize themselves. It's not enough to have a national structure, there needs to be like viable local structures beyond just like an Instagram page or something, but actually where they meet each other, where they work with each other, and they can do something about it. <coughs> and yeah, just from all of this, I can kind of sum it up. I think there's like two main priorities that we need to have, especially this summer as the next semester is gonna come and that we can build on so that we can be as active as possible in September and going forward. First, we need to consolidate the movement. And by this, I mean that we need to educate and uh, include and integrate all the newcomers, all the new people that haven't been active yet but that joined us recently. We need to give them the tools so that they can actually become organizers. We need to teach them how to organize a protest, how to counter capitalism if, if the police is trying to attack you, how to do the, the, the theoretical work that's also needed in organizing. 
because if we're not able to like include them, then there, there's going to be no direction to like this new spur of energy, and that's going to make it easier for our opponents, for our enemies, to just destroy it very easily. And I think the second really important point is that on the student side, I think on the staff side, it's actually the other way around, but on the student side, now that we have like solid local groups, we actually need to build a national coordination, a national structure. Because before October, I think there's a few people in this room, we were trying, we had like a coalition of like eight or nine cities, and we were trying to improve the coordination between those cities and make it work. But then obviously October happened and they all break down because we all had to deal with so many stuff at the same time. But now that we have rebuilt our position, that we are stronger locally, we need to build a national coordination. So for example, I don't know, if we feel like UVA is getting closer to, break in, to the breaking point, then we can concentrate all of our forces on UVA, and then we break the chain, and then we can attack somewhere else again. So that's, I think, the necessity. And finally, when we're going to be able to kind of meet these two conditions, then we can have fun. We can start having fun next semester. We can start escalating again. We're going back on campuses and making it clear to our universities that they're not done with us, that they're never going to be done with us, and that as long as they don't obey to our demands, then they're going to face chaos, they're going to face a mess on their campuses, and they're going to have to deal with it in a way or another. And hopefully, I mean, actually, no, not hopefully, but like for sure, we will cut these bloody ties between our universities and the Zionist regime, whether they want it or not. For now, we need to I'm a member of ROSA. We are a Marxist organization in Amsterdam, so our main focus is not Palestine, unfortunately, but we're very happy to be speaking here today, as we've been have a uh, very involved in this movement as well. So I'd like to use my speaking time here today to focus on ele an element of a struggle that I think has received less attention than it should. Um, I think there's a need for us to sharpen our view, not just towards the violence and atrocities in Palestine, but to have a clear view of its cause. This cause is the contradiction between US American imperialism and its allies and the rest of the world. As it was pointed out by the PFLP, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, in 1969, the main enemies of the Palestinian struggle are Israel, the world Zionist movement, world imperialism headed by the US, and Arab reaction. The United States being the main contradiction, contradiction in our global system, it's also, as we know, the principal enabler and sponsor of the Zionist state. It is important for us, who are part of this international movement for the liberation of Palestine, to be always reminded that Palestine is not an isolated issue, that it goes far beyond a humanitarian cause. Palestine plays a central role in the global imperialist system, U.S. imperialism requires Israel to secure its position as the main hegemon. Therefore, Palestine liberation, as we understand it, including one democratic state of Palestine within the pre-1948 borders, full right of return, and freedom to all prisoners, requires the defeat of U.S. imperialism to be victorious. Taking that into account, as we have all been seeing, the student movement is on the front lines of the struggle for justice in Palestine in the West taking a pivotal role by engaging in direct confrontation with the police, the armed wing of the state, and being victim of staunch repression from our universities as well as the media. It's important, however, to emphasize that we're not alone and that this movement is most definitely not carried only by students. We're fighting together with workers from within the university, from outside of the university. We're together with all sorts of progressive groups with people from the Netherlands, Europe, Arabs, Palestinians, and people from all over the world. The fact that the student movement, oh, sorry, the fact that the students are taking such a central role in advancing the struggle in the West means that the student movement in much of the Western world is currently on the front lines of fighting against imperialism as a whole. It's critical, therefore, that we make sure to really incorporate this into our political rhetoric, our narrative, and our slogans. 
We must make it clear that fighting for a liberated Palestine means engaging, engaging in direct confrontation with American imperialism. It is our duty to embrace and carry the struggle. Given our governments and institutions historic and ongoing complicity, it's a duty to engage in this fight. Due to Palestine's centrality to the global imperialist system, it's also a necessity if we wish to struggle towards our own liberation and that of all exploited peoples in this world. Our fight must, clearly, must be clearly connected to the broader anti-imperialist struggle. <coughs> As students, we find ourselves in this weird spot where we are directly fighting against, imperialist, against this imperialist system, but at the same time, we are appealing to the same imperialist structures to abandon one of, one of their most valuable assets. But we are under no illusions, at least we shouldn't be. Can we appeal to, to imperialist powers to abandon their imperialist base in West Asia? Even with refutable evidence, irrefutable evidence of crimes against humanity, can we expect a change in conscience, consciousness from them? Of course not. We are under no impression that the West or its bourgeois institutions could ever be the driving force of Palestinian liberation. The only ones capable of achieving victory, capable of liberating Palestine from occupation, Zionism and imperialism, are the Palestinians themselves in their armed struggle. And therefore, we should always support them above all. The Palestinian resistance should always be the guiding force in our movement and should always be incorporated in our political discourse. We must never shy away, we must never shy away from bringing up the importance and centrality of Palestinian resistance, the martyrs, the prisoners, and all those who face the imperialist enemy firsthand. However, our struggle happens in multiple levels. As we aim to combat the Zionist entity from multiple fronts, the demands for boycott, divestment, and sanctions are also an important part of the struggle. And it's also been in multiple anti-colonial struggles of the 20th, 20th century. As students, the university is our main site of struggle. And as a student organization, our aim is to organize people where they are and use the levers of power that we have. To us, the demand of an academic boycott is one of the most impactful ways we can be in service to the Palestinian liberation struggle. We do not see the academic boycott as an end by itself, but part of a broader anti-imperialist struggle. And part of the struggle is to discursively and politically delegitimize imperialist institutions. The academic boycott is seen as an important tactic to challenge and weaken the Zionist state materially and ideologically, and to denormalize having relationships relationships with Israel. The academic boycott and other forms of BDS tactics should not, however, delegitimize or replace other forms of struggle. It should be the floor, not the ceiling of our movement. So the student intifada that we're witnessing and taking part right now has a very special character. First of all, the Netherlands has not seen a student movement this big since 2015. With this one, I've heard being far more radical in its politics and methods. Um, now, while it pursues as its focal goal the academic boycott, it does not confine itself to institutional forms of struggle. With the incorporation of several forms of direct action, such as encampments and occupations, the movement has been able to successfully disrupt several universities around the country, forcing many of them to temporarily close and adapt their teaching schedule to the protests, showing how much power we can have when we act strategically and apply the right amount of pressure. The movement has also been able to gather impressive mass support despite attempts from the university administration and the corporate media to fabricate and emphasize controversies. The student movement has adopted a much more radical and principled politics than pre previously seen. The students have wholeheartedly incorporated a pro-resistance rhetoric, which hasn't been seen in this scale in the Netherlands before. The movement has also seemed to have adopted an anti-capitalist ethos, and this can be attributed to the high involvement of anarchists and communists in the movement, but also to the fact, but also to the fact that people are every day getting more um, educated in the matter, and the links between imperialism, colonialism, and capitalism are becoming much clearer and harder to ignore. We therefore cannot undermine the incredible radicalizing power of this moment, and we really must seize the opportunity to consolidate a wider anti-imperialist revolutionary movement. That can persist even as can persist even after we inevitably lose momentum. The unprecedented nature of our movement is also something unique and to be applauded. The fact that so many people new to activism 
are willing to put their bodies on the line for the Palestinian cause shows the commitment and the poten potential for a long-term <coughs> movement. That also brings me to the need for us to also be cautious about the sustainability of our movement. As the protests seem to be slowing down, there shouldn't be a reason for us to be disappointed or worried, but simply to reanalyze the strategy and tactics and see how we can continue to escalate, but in ways that allow us to bring huge masses of people with us. It's important that we never lose sight of the fact that at the end of the day, our strength will always be in our numbers, and unfortunately, even the most committed people cannot carry the struggle by themselves if the, mass, if the great masses of people are not taking part and also leading the movement. The movement grew immensely in a, in a, and in a very spontaneous manner. So in order to avoid it from stifling, we must really get together and strategize in unity how to go forward. Which leads me to my very final point, which is that I think we have an incredible opportunity here to continue carrying the struggle to an ever bigger and more revolutionary struggle. Um, and that's because we've never been disconnected before. Um, it's incredible to see how all the encampments in the country are in contact with each other and also in contact with encampments all over the world. And this for sure gives us enormous powers, uh, enormous power. If we can maintain these connections and organize, sorry, this gives us enormous powers, enormous power for us to continue with these connections and organizing with unity as we go forward. So I think we have a world to win. Thank you.